Hi, I'm Tony, and this is Long Story Short. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about a story that's a bit longer and more complex than usual. As a result, there's going to be a lot of science, there's going to be a lot of words, and it may get a bit complicated at times. Now, if you're anything like me, that makes you excited. You're about to learn. But even if that doesn't make you excited, maybe if that even makes you a little bit apprehensive, I encourage you to put on your thinking cap or whatever metaphorical device it is that helps you to learn, and I encourage you to stick around, because what we're talking about today is important. So without further ado, you ready to talk about the next big leap in medicine? Probably one of the single most impactful things in the next hundred years? Probably. If so, keep watching. Assuming you've watched a few videos I've already uploaded or really have spent any time on YouTube's educational side, you probably get the picture by now that we're alive during a crazy time in human development. Another big contributor to the current state of society is medicine. The past hundred years have been rife with medical breakthroughs, with notable advancements such as antibiotics and organ transplantation, changing the face of human health. We've eliminated a lot of the things that used to kill us. I mean, there's a reason why we've multiplied like crazy. It used to be way easier to get yourself killed. That being said, because we've gotten so good at fighting off things that kill us, those that remain are, well, they're tricky. The diseases that ravage us today are often persistent, complex, and difficult to treat. But that may be about to change in the same way that devastating bacterial infections were drastically reduced and controlled with antibiotics. A relatively new medical technology seeks to address many of the more tenacious problems still faced in medicine. Enter gene therapy. You've probably heard about it. We could talk about it for hours and barely scratch the surface, but it's a big deal. And it's looking pretty likely that gene therapy in some way, shape or form will be this century's antibiotics, except possibly bigger than that. So what's the history? How does it work? And what does it mean for the future? Here's a really long story short. Gene therapy works with DNA, the fundamental blueprints that determine the design and function of all known life to correct genetic components of complex, multigenic, and multifactorial disease. In simpler terms, gene therapy seeks to combat disease by tinkering with life, both in the form of the victims of disease and in the agents that cause it, at its most basic level. The science behind gene therapy really got to a start in the 1940s. DNA, short for deoxyribonucleic acid, was first properly identified in 1944, following years of experiments in which strange transformations were noticed in pneumococcus bacteria. By the early 1950s, it was determined that bacteria transfer genetic material by mating, or importantly, bacteriophages, viruses that infect and reproduce within cells, were also found to transfer genetic materials between cells in a process called transduction. This discovery introduced us to our first tool for modifying genetic material, viruses. The 1960s were, as a result, characterized by the development of cell lines for testing genetic modification. Initial attempts at this type of gene transfer were extremely inefficient, lacking the ability to get any changes to really stick in any reproducible way. Even so, when it worked, it worked, and it was determined that viruses could be used to transfer genetic information to cells. Now we knew that it was possible, and if there's one thing we humans need to really start running with an idea, it's just the knowledge that it's possible. Lots of great things start this way. Anyway, by the 1970s, it was becoming increasingly clear that the technology could have therapeutic use. In 1983, a bunch of scientists met at the Banbury Conference Center on Long Island, New York, to discuss the future of gene therapy. The technology has advanced slowly but surely ever since. This is not to say that accidents didn't happen. One well-publicized and especially tragic incident occurred in 1999. Jesse Gelsinger, an 18-year-old undergoing treatment for a terminal genetic liver disease, died when her immune system responded poorly to the treatment. But by the early 2000s, gene therapy was becoming safer and more viable for commercial use. By 2003, this commercial viability was realized in China with the development of Gendison, a treatment for a common form of cancer in the country. It works very well. 
But you probably haven't heard much about all this history because a lot of the really cool gene therapy news is much more recent. Let's talk more about the specifics of how this stuff works. In some ways, gene therapy today works with the same tools we discovered all those years ago, viruses. In short, because viruses work by modifying cells' genes to make copies of themselves, they make useful tools for genetic modification in general, if you can figure out how to customize what the virus changes. That last part is really, really hard though. Specific types of viruses need to be engineered for specific tasks. They don't always target specific sections of DNA very well. Some require cells to divide in order to work. Others are more flexible, but are more likely to provoke an immune response, which, as mentioned earlier, isn't good. Safer non-viral methods also exist, generally relying on materials with positive charges to interact with negatively charged DNA. But these methods are usually less efficient, which is a big deal when dealing with tiny things like cells and DNA. To make much meaningful change, you need to be able to work on many, many cells quickly and effectively. Enter CRISPR-Cas9, the recent breakthrough in gene therapy technology. You may have even heard of this already. Lots of people are talking about it like some kind of magic bullet for gene therapy. And in some ways, it is but the technology is still very new. Let's talk about what it can do. CRISPR is cool because it shows potential for reducing or solving some of the problems mentioned earlier. Even more interesting, it does this by tackling the problem from the opposite side of things. CRISPR finds its origins in the way cells have been fighting off viruses for a very long time. In bacteria, CRISPR-Cas9 acts kind of like a cellular scale immune system, trying to provide cells with the ability to acquire immunity to viruses. It consists of two parts. CRISPR, or Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, is a molecule made up of RNA, which is itself a sort of half piece of DNA. Cas9, the other part, is essentially an enzyme, or cellular tool for chemical reactions that can search and cut into DNA at specific locations before putting it back together. Used together, CRISPR acts as a guide telling Cas9 where and how to cut DNA. Cells in nearly all forms of life use this system to repair DNA damages from viruses. In the past decade, scientists have been working on learning to program the system allowing targeted DNA sequences to be cut out and replaced. And we're already using this stuff. The first test in mammalian DNA took place in 2013. Before we get too carried away though, keep in mind that this technology is very new. It isn't foolproof. Consider it something like an early computer or cell phone. There's a lot of potential here. Now that CRISPR is on the scene, lots of people with lots of time, smarts, and money are looking at gene therapy. Up until now, there have existed some serious obstacles to this stuff going mainstream. Gabor Rubani outlines a few of them in a paper published in the Molecular Aspects of Medicine, two of which are especially addressed by CRISPR. First, new vectors or tools are needed for gene therapy. And for anything really effective to be done, they need to be universal. Rubani, like many others, thought that this was extremely unlikely. CRISPR changes that though. While CRISPR-Cas9 isn't 100% universal yet, it's our best bet so far. Again, it requires way less work to get up and running compared to other methods. Rubani's other major point is accuracy. Specifically, we need a tool that can be aimed more precisely. You can't just dump something into a person that starts modifying DNA in all of their cells. Similarly, you can't have those modifications dumped just anywhere in their DNA. CRISPR addresses this by being all around a more accurate tool, very specifically designed by nature to do what it does. We're still working on making it better for our purposes though. We're not super good at using it yet because, let's be honest, we're not nature. If all of that got a bit technical and I started to lose you, don't worry. Here's the big takeaway. CRISPR is a new tool. We've still got a lot to learn, but everything is pointing to it being an incredibly useful and flexible tool for genetic modification. That's important because all of our existing tools are anything but. As we get better at using CRISPR and other gene therapy technologies, the implications for the future get to be pretty big. CRISPR could be used to fight many of the diseases we're still struggling to handle today. 
The same paper lists many candidates, including cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, cardiovascular disease, HIV AIDS, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, ALS, various cancers, and many more. The ability to edit life's blueprints is incredibly powerful, after all. If you all want another video covering specifically how gene therapy can be used and fighting some of these diseases, please let me know. But it doesn't end there, because again, we're talking about the blueprints for life here. This is much bigger than just disease. These tools allow medical science to move beyond fighting disease and into the realm of fighting imperfections in the very design of the human body. If this makes you uncomfortable, well, it should. These aren't developments that should be taken lightly. The processes that could eliminate a propensity for cancer could also be used to eliminate disability in general. Taking things further, with enough precision, these tools could eliminate average ability as well. A study of non-professional evaluations of gene therapy by Jackie Leach Scully et al. in Social Sciences and Medicine brings to light a number of concerns which will likely face our society. With body and identity, natural will no longer have to be satisfactory. The potential exists for it to be perfected by technology. Disability, as it becomes more easily and broadly correctable, will likely be seen more than ever as a flaw in one's true identity. Eugenics and intolerance may find their way back into societal conversation as flaws become more easily eliminated. This can be quite dangerous, considering the often subjective nature of what actually constitutes a flaw. Financially, this technology will take time to develop. Treatment for diseases and genetic augmentation will, for a time, probably only be available to society's wealthier members. On top of all this, authorities will surely have access to this technology. How will society react to the idea of sculpting living beings with military intent? None of these questions have easy answers. In fact, these questions are so foreign to the human cultural experience that they currently don't seem to have any answers at all. Regardless, it is increasingly likely that society will soon face these questions. So. That was a lot, because it is a lot. Gene therapy is a powerful technology with a surprisingly long history. For the overwhelming majority of that history, it's been on the outskirts of most medical applications, primarily because it's just so damn complicated. And it's also very hard to get right. That said, the areas where it does find success tend to be super important. Gene therapy is a tool that stands a chance to fight against some of the few big medical threats that remain to humanity, like cancer. With the introduction of more effective tools like CRISPR-Cas9, it seems likely that one way or another, gene technology is coming to the mainstream in the near future. Given the vast set of applications it has, from disease to sculpting the human genome, it's scary. At least, it's scary to me. Honestly, I don't know how much I'd trust us to handle something like this. But we're going to have to, because once the technology arrives, someone will use it. The 20th century showed us that when it comes to technology, trying to stop something like this is kind of futile. It's not the first time humanity has gotten its hands on something it almost certainly wasn't ready for. The bad forces in the world will use it regardless. That's how they work, they don't care. I'm hopeful that the good in us will use these technologies as well, responsibly, to improve the species and the life experiences of its members. One way or another, we're along for the ride. I'll try to keep you all updated as we go along. Thank you all so much for watching, as usual. This video was a hell of a project because Gene therapy, I almost feel like anything with genetic technology and research and stuff like that. Um, it's just a lot. And on top of being a lot, there's not a lot of mediated content to go along with it. There's not a lot of um, stock footage or graphics and the avenues that I usually go to to get my hands on that kind of stuff. That coupled with the, pa with the uh, fact that this past week has been absolute hell in my personal life. This video ended up being pretty light on the uh, stock footage and visuals and heavier on me just presenting and speaking. 
So I guess now's as good of a time as any to ask, what do y'all think of that? Was I able to hold your attention without that much uh, stuff in between? I don't know. Food for thought. This kind of stuff really does interest me, though. I mean, it really does seem like this is going to be the future of medicine, and the ethical and societal implications really are as crazy as I made them out to be in this video. Uh, this stuff has the potential to really change the face of society. This video was ultimately adapted from a paper I wrote um, not quite a year ago about gene therapy. I will link the sources for that paper in the, in the description below. I'll probably link the paper in the description below at some point too. I just need to go through it and uh, update a few things before I do. Thankfully though, with that being done, I was able to put out this project with really way more research than I'd usually be able to do in a one week period, at least during the school year. So yeah, I know this one was a lot of words, but I think at least it was a lot of interesting words. I hope that you found listening to and learning about this stuff as fun as I found learning about this stuff and then writing and speaking about it. As usual, any constructive feedback is always appreciated. I am always trying to improve the quality of these videos. And if this one was uh, really kind of heavy and technical for you, don't worry, I'm going to make sure to do something a little bit more simple for my sake and yours next week. As usual, if you didn't like this video, you know what to do, but if you did like it, and or if you want to see more, please like this video and subscribe. That's how you can let me know that you like what I'm doing and encourage me to do more. Again, I'm Tony Pearson. Hope you all have a fantastic week. Until next time, this is Long Story Short.